big news. Finally, I can share with you something I've been wanting to talk to you about for a long time. I always felt a certain empathy for the villain, the quote unquote villain, because I really just felt like they were just misunderstood people. Somehow I felt like something went wrong to make them who they were. It wasn't just that. That was part of it. But another part of me really questioned what is good, what is evil? Does good and evil even really exist? Maybe there is no good and evil. Maybe everything just is. Or can something that's perceived to be evil be good in the long run? For instance, when you're reading or watching a time travel story, the whole question, do you murder a child who you know for a fact is going to grow up to be you know, Hitler? Is the greater crime killing a young Hitler? Or is the greater crime allowing that child to grow up to be who you know he is going to be? So the actions that he takes as an adult will transpire. Which crime is greater? Harry Potter were dealt with this decision. Harry would almost definitely let the child live and say, you know, we need to deal with Hitler when we deal with him. Harry Potter doesn't even kill anyone other than Voldemort, I believe. Spoiler alert, sorry guys. But that was my thing with Harry. Harry would fight against Death Eaters, people were trying to kill him, and he would just say, expel the arms and run through. But someone always had to come behind him and really get rid of that Death Eater for good. I'm talking specifically that last battle in Deathly Hallows, when they're going through Hogwarts, several teachers and students have to actually kill. I may be also confusing the film with the book. Harry Potter doesn't kill anyone. It's the only way to keep him as innocent as he could be. I understand that. But I also feel like that's an easy out for Harry Potter, which is why I believe that a lot of times villains do the things that heroes are either too afraid to do or can't do for reason of staying good, quote unquote, which means that villains often get a bad rap. Villains tend to be pragmatists. They often see the world as it is, in all its beauty and horror. There's so much to explore there. So that's exactly what we're going to have. Excuse if I have this grin on my face, because like, I'm just really excited. So let's pretend that 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 all oh, this isn't happening. Okay, I am putting together an anthology called Because You Love to Hate Me. It is a YA villain themed anthology published by Bloomsbury, who publishes Harry Potter. Don't even get me started on how I think that's so cool. And it is going to be published spring 2017, and I'm so, so incredibly excited. 13 booktubers with 13 critically acclaimed best selling authors writing prompt style. I am also contributing a short story, so super excited about that. There are plenty of amazing people involved, so I'm going to go down the list. On the author side, we have Amory, that would be me, Renee Audier, Somanchi Nani, Susan Denner, Sarah Eddy, Marissa Meyer, Cindy Pond, Victoria Schwab, Samantha Shannon, Adam Silvera, Andrew Smith, April Jean Viev to Hulk, and Nicola Yoon. And on the booktube side, Benjamin Alderson of Benjamin of Tomes, Sasha Alsberg of A Book Utopia, Whitney Atkinson of Witty Novels, Christina of Christina Reads YA and the Lushables channel, Katrina of A Little Book Owl, Jesse George of Jesse the Reader, Zoe Hurt of Read by Zoe, Samantha Lane of Thoughts on Tomes, Sophia Lee of The Book Basement, Raylene LeMay of Padford and Proms 07, Reagan Peruse of Peruse Project, Christine Riccio of Polo Bananas Books, Steph Sinclair and Kat Kennedy of the Cuddle Buggery blog and channel. So I just wanted to share that news with you all. You already know that I write fiction and this short story will be my first published work. So yay! Definitely stay tuned to find out which author is paired with which booktuber and what the prompts are going to be and the villains chosen. So that is my announcement. Yay! Hi guys, it's Amory and I have an insane amount of books. Because there are so many books, I'm not gonna go too much into what they're about, especially because some of them I've actually reviewed or you know reviewed in my wrap up. And because I do have so many books, I did categorize them loosely. Books that I've already read and I've spoken to you about. In that same group, there are books that I read on ebook, but I wanted the hardcover because I wanted to add them to my library. And then I also have a nonfiction section. So let's get started. Let's start with fiction, books that I haven't read yet. Wolf and White Van, this is by John Darnell. This novel debuted to a lot of fanfare, a lot of buzz, and all I know is that it's about a young gamer who gets caught up in some kind of situation, a deadly situation perhaps, I'm not really sure. He's kind of a recluse, but the lines between reality and gaming are blurred because I believe it's one of those reality role-playing games and the story is told in reverse. End to the beginning. 
but the beginning is still the climax. When it comes to really slim volumes, you really want to know as little as possible. There aren't a lot of pages, so it's very easy to be spoiled. The Wrath and the Dawn by Renee Adier. It's the author's take on Arabian Nights or 1001 Nights. So I'm really excited to read this. I did peek into the book to look at some of the chapter names, just to see some of the writing, and it was gorgeous. Meditations on Gossamer and Gold. Okay, I won't go too far into the book because I don't want to spoil myself. A Silk Cord and a Sunrise. They're just beautiful titles. Silver and the Blood by Jessica De George. All I know about the standalone is Romania, Dracula, New York Society. Antigone by Sophocles. I have not read this before. It's part of my Book Riot Read Harder Challenge. Thanks for the Trouble by Tommy Wallach. I have yet to read We All Looked Up. This one seems pretty interesting, so I'm going to do what I usually don't do, which is read the latest book and then go back to his first. Because usually I like to read an author's older work and then go to their newer one just to get a feel for their work and their writing. Something about this one just made me want to jump right in. It's basically about a guy who meets a girl who claims to be a hundred and something years old and I don't know if this is magical realism or contemporary. I'm not going to look at where it's categorized in Goodreads because that can be spoilers too. So we'll see how this goes. Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Nothing but amazing things about this novel. This is set in the Grisha universe on a different island that we never really encountered in the Shadow and Bone series. Multiple POVs, multiple characters, a heist, beautiful black pages. So excited to read this. How to Tell Toledo from the Night Sky by Lydia Netzer. This book is about two people at the Toledo Institute of Astronomy. They meet. They fall in love and then they find out that they were not destined to fall in love but set up from the beginning to fall in love. One of the big questions in the novel is can it be true love if it's been set up from birth? There's astronomy, love, fate, and destiny and I can't wait to read it. Truth Wish by Susan Dennard. I won't go too much into this one because this has already been all over booktube. It's essentially about a world where witches have different kinds of witcheries, I believe. There are other kind of witches too but I only know that the Truth Witch is able to tell the truth when someone's speaking and a thread witch is able to see the threads between people, for instance, their relationship. Huge, huge buzz, lots of anticipation. The School for Good and Evil series by Soman Chainani. The School for Good and Evil, a World Without Princes, The Last Ever After. This series is about two young girls who go to the wrong school. You have two schools, one is a school for good and one is a school for evil, and you pretty much know which school you're going to get into. But for whatever reason, these two girls are switched. So those are the novels that I haven't read, so I'm going to just go through really quickly some of the books that I've already discussed, but I didn't haul them technically, so um, as a reminder. The Best American Science Fiction, edited by Joe Hill and John Joseph Adams. Yes, yes, yes. If you're even a little interested in short stories and speculative fiction, I highly recommend this anthology. So, so good. I talked about it recently and love it. Highly recommend. V.E. Schwab's A Gathering of Shadows, book two in the Darker Shade of Magic series. I think my favorite thing about this book was finding out more about White London and... Oh wait, I can ask a spoiler, hold on. The thing that happens in White London and the character that's there. I feel like we're going to definitely be in for some... for a tug of war with our own emotions when it comes to book three. That's all I'll say. All the Birds in the Sky by Charlie Jane Anders. If you remember from my recent video, this was one of my most anticipated reads of 2016. I had mixed feelings about this one. There were certain elements that I really loved, but there were also some things that I wish we saw more of, some things that I wish we delved deeper into. The following books are books that I read on ebook from the library, but I definitely wanted to have my own copy for my own library. The Dumb House by John Burnside. If you want to read a first person account of an extremely disturbed person, this book is for you. Dark Eden by Chris Beckett. I cannot sing the praises of this book enough. It's one of my favorite books of all time. The Fisherman by Chigozi Obioma. It was shortlisted for the Man Booker Award and I loved this book. It's a story of a family that's torn apart by the prophecies of a madman. That's a good one sentence thing. It's parable-esque in its telling and it's beautiful. Sweetness Number no. 9 by Stephen Eric Clark. I love dry, sarcastic humor. That's my favorite kind of humor. And this book is chock full of it. I told you about this book too, but a long time ago. And I, I listened to it on audiobook, which was really great. It's basically about a guy who works for a... It's kind of like Splenda. The sugar is called Sweetness Number no. 9. And he sees firsthand the effects of the sugar. And we go from how some of the results in the lab extended to his family and to the world at large. He kind of just stood by and watched everything unfold. And we see how he deals with the whole situation every step of the way. Very good. Laugh out loud funny. If you like dry, sarcastic humor, British humor, this book is right up your alley. So when I was a kid, I was obsessed with The Wizard of Oz. Not the movie 
movie and not even the first book, but the entire world that L. Frank Baum created. I think I read every single book. There might have been one or two books that I didn't read, and I think he wrote maybe 15. And I found these in Barnes & Noble. The first five novels of The Wizard of Oz, 6 through 10, books 11 through 15. These books have the original illustrations, so they really take me back. I get this whole nostalgic feeling because I remember pouring over these in the library. They were so creepy and so creative and just so fantastical. I always felt there was a certain creep factor to the entire series. You know how clowns can go from really funny, happy, and cheery? I don't know who actually thinks that. I don't see that, but I'm sure someone does because I think that's the whole point of the clowns, right? But at the same time, people feel like they're really creepy. Carnivals, too and circuses, certain fun-loving side, but a creepy, scary side to them as well. And I felt that way about the Oz world. So amazing and so gorgeous, but at the same time, freaking creepy. And now I have all 15 books in three huge volumes. I was really happy about finding these. So now let's move on to the nonfiction. I have a lot of nonfiction books too. Speaking of childhood favorites, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland Decoded by David Day. This is an interesting book. It gives you the entire text of Alice in, Alice in Wonderland, but it tells you the hidden meanings and the symbolism that are embedded all throughout the original story. You see some of the relationships that Lewis Carroll had with different people. There were certain politicians that he kind of coded within the story. Esoteric symbolism and meaning and theme. Just a gorgeous book. When I was a kid, aside from being obsessed with ESP and the occult. I was also a big lover of mythology and I, mean, I loved mythology so much it's funny that now I'm not that into it. I used to be obsessed with mythology. So I picked up Mythology by Edith Hamilton. It's for the most part a reference book. She does go into what the different mythologies were but she also divides everything into like the houses and this type of mythology and that type of mythology, the greater gods and the lower gods. Apparently it's a big classic on the subject. Perfect for my brushing up lessons. Hot House by Boris Kochka. The Art of Survival and the Survival of Art at America's Most Celebrated Publishing House. Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud. The man himself. Oh. The men. Doomed to Repeat by Bill Fawcett. The lessons of history we failed to learn. He basically goes through different historical events and what we could do to learn from history. The Art of Language Invention by David J. Peterson. From Horse Lords to Dark Elves, the words behind world building. David J. Peterson is the one who created Dothraki for Game of Thrones on HBO. You know, George R. R. Martin created a few words, but when they did the show, they really needed someone to flesh out. I don't like that word flesh out. It always grosses me out to really expand the language so they could actually use the language in dialogue on the show and he goes through how he did that. The next three books bring us to England, The Plantagenist by Dan Jones, The War of the Roses, The Fall of the Plantagenist and the Rise of the Tudors. This is also by Dan Jones. This was a very interesting and bloody time. There was a lot of fighting over the throne within the family. The Tudors by G.J. Myers, who were dealing with Henry VIII and Boleyn, Queen Catherine, I believe her name was Catherine. She was the Spanish princess that King Henry married first, his first wife who is also the daughter of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who commissioned Columbus to sail. I really want to delve into this whole period because I really wanted to learn a lot about the political machinations and the infighting. Another history book, A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. This book covers a lot of what we've learned in history classes, but from the voices of people who are usually voiceless in our history books. That was a lot of books and I am thirsty. It actually refreshed my desire to pick up some of these because I've got my TBR set for this month, but now I'm kind of like, I don't know. So hopefully you saw some things that intrigued you. I hope you have a fabulous month of reading and that you pick up some cool books if you're interested in picking up books if you're not on a book buying ban. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it. Please share the video and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I will see you later. Bye!